Godhead are actively involved in creating the earth, just as all three were actively involved in providing redemption for each one of us. Now, I want you to note, uh, let, let's read our text beginning in verse 24 of Genesis 1 as we come to this last day of creation. In verse 24, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and mul multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for thy meat." And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Um, thus, chapter 2, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, in verse 24 and 25, he made the cattle, the creeping things, and the beasts of the earth. Now, when, when God said, the word of God spoke, let the earth bring forth. Now, notice it was the earth bring forth. God created or made the creatures after the elements had been formed. So he just simply took of the elements of the earth that was already there and made animals. And then when they die, they go back to the elements of the earth. Um, now, the, back in the fifth day, in verse 20, God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that fly over the earth. And in verse 21, And God created great whales. Here he simply says in verse 25, God made the beast of the earth after his kind. Now, what's the difference? Creation is something that is formed out of nothing. But to make is to take something that has already been formed and to put it together in the structure and order that he chooses. Now, note the three divisions of the land animals. Cattle would be a reference to the domesticated animals used by man. The beast of the earth is speaking of the large wild animals, dinosaurs, lions, elephants, and so forth. The creeping things are those that, that creep or crawl on the ground, the small animals and amphibians, insects and spiders. Can you believe it? But Adam had bees that had no stingers. <laughs> um, and that is going to happen again in the millennium. I hope the Lord lets me be a beekeeper then too. <laughs> but all three classes were made at the same time. Um, the order, notice the order between when these animals were created and the birds and the, the water animals. Um, the evolution says that the insects uh, came and then the amphibians and then reptiles before there were birds. But we see here the sixth day that they were created after. There is no evolutionary struggle of the in the uh, strength of the species or in the origin of the species 
there is no uh, struggle for survival of the fittest or anything like that because there was no death and because God said that it was good. He brought them forth from the ground, from the elements already there, and they were energized by the word of God when he said, let there be. And thus he spoke all land animals into existence. Well, he did something similar but different, beginning in verse 26, when he made man. Now again, he made man. Man came from the elements already created, and God formed them together to create man. Now, up to now, God and God said, let there be. But now, he says, he, it's as if he speaks to himself, which he does, of what, what he will do. In other words, instead of saying, let there be, he says, let us make man in our image. Highlighting the reality that God is a plural God that there are three persons in one Godhead. All throughout Scripture, the Bible says over and over again, there's one God, period. And there is. But there is one God in three persons. Don't understand it. That's what he said. I'm not going to try to explain it, because to explain it is to start a new denomination. The fact is, that's what he said. So that's what it is. Now here he highlights his plurality, but notice what he says. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. He was not speaking to angels, because man is not like angels. And that would put them on an equality with God, which they're not. Um, he could only be speaking of and to himself. One member of the Godhead speaking to the other members. And there's a number of passages throughout Scripture where he does that on other occasions as well where he is communing with himself as he makes, um, as he contemplates uh, actions he's about to make. Now, mankind is the most complex of all the creatures that were made. Uh, he goes on to say, let them have dominion, them, man, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the cattle, over all the earth, the whole earth, so that would include everything in the earth, the plants, and the ground and everything, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And everything, in other words, every living thing, God said man would have dominion, including the earth, which has within it the living source to generate plants. So in one hand, his body would be made as the other animals were made out of the dust of the ground. He would have the breath of life, Yet man would be altogether different because of this one, one phrase, let us make man in our image. Now, there's a lot of debate as to exactly what that means. Um, to be made into God's image. Number one, man would be given an eternal spirit, like God's spirit, like the angel's. Uh, in other words, when we are born, our life is going to be there somewhere uh, in our body forever. We have become eternal. Two, man is created with a moral consciousness. Animals do not. Sometimes we train a dog that is very dear to our hearts, and it appears that they they whine when things are, uh, are, are, when you yell at them. Uh, you think there's emotions and things like that. But it's a trained instinct. It is not moral consciousness. Number three, man is able to think abstractly. We can think about love. We can think about beauty. Animals don't comprehend it at all. In fact, many animals are uh, colorblind. Um, Further, man has the capability of knowing beauty and emotions. Animals do not. You never see a dog propped up staring at the sunset because he thinks it's so beautiful. <laughs> um, above all, man has the capacity, different from all the animals. Only man has the capacity to know God, to worship him, 
and to love him. Brethren, that is the primary difference between us and animals in that we have that capacity. And the irony, (laughs) the irony is so intense that God made man in his own image with that capacity. Some have said, and I think rightly so, that God has created us with a hole so large only God can fill it. Yet man would choose to try to fill it with every element of rebellion he can think of. Anything but God. Man tries religion, man tries hedonism, man tries all kinds of perversions, thinking he can fill that need in his heart, and it's just not there, because only God can fill it. Only, we only have that peace and contentment when we know him, and we are walking with him. Now, God gave man the choice whether or not to love and worship him or not. Um, Calvinists really have fits when I say this, but in reality, God has limited himself in creating us with the ability to choose. Uh, He doesn't force anyone to come to himself. He could have made us in such a way that that's the only way we would respond to him, but he didn't. He has chosen to limit himself in saying, whosoever will, in letting us decide whether or not we'll believe in him. Now, God would love mankind. God would speak to him. God would tell him of his love for him. But he allows man to choose whether or not he'll believe. But then... One aspect that we, I hadn't really thought about in the past, but one aspect of being made in the image of God is what about the physical body of man? Now, we know that God created us to function in such a way that it is consistent with the expressions of humanity that God says about himself. God sees, he hears, he smells, and so forth, And then further, every appearance that God had made to man in the Old Testament, in a a pre-Christ incarnation, as it were, or pre-Christ appearance, uh, his appearance to man is always in human form. He appears to be man. When the angels came came to get get Lot and his family out of of Sodom, uh, there is no surprised at seeing an angel. Apparently there was no wings, it was just men that were there and they were angels. Um, But the biggest reason for thinking that there is something about our physical appearance that reflects the image of God is that when he would come to redeem mankind, he made us in his image, then he took on the form of man and when he came and man was made in the image of God's Son. Um, I'm not in my own spirit satisfied uh, completely with this explanation, but in a way it kind of makes sense in that man is made with a physical body. God did say he made us in his image, so there is a certain physical aspect. God is a spirit, so he doesn't have a body as such, but yet... It appears that in making us in his image, both male and female represent him. Well, that's what he said they was going to do, and then he was going to give dominion and so forth. So in verse 27, God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, and male and female created them. So both male and female are in his image, and this is just a summary of creating woman. And then God blessed them, and God said to them, Now notice this. This is his command. First of all, his blessing. He blessed them. And then he said unto them his instructions. He gave them work to do. He said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. The word replenish means to fill. Not to refill. It means to fill. Uh, And subdue it. And then have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air. Now the point is, 
in his blessing, instructions, and commissions, he says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Now, that has not yet happened. There is much of the earth that is still unfilled. There are deserts that have very few. Many have none. There are ice caps that have very few, if any. There's tundra. There's jungles. There's much open space still on the earth. Brethren, there is no such thing as a population explosion. If you, were to, if you were to get everyone in the whole earth to come to one place, let's say Jacksonville, Florida, there would not be enough people to fill the area that is equal to the city limits of Jacksonville, Florida. Um, if you allow for two square feet for each person, <laughs> some would take more, many, especially children, would take less. But the point is, there is no such thing as a population explosion. Further, the earth could feed many more people in the world than man will allow. The reason many people starve in places such as in India, African countries, is not because there's not enough food, but they have the wrong religion. They believe that that cow that would feed them for many days is their aunt, their uncle, their ancestor, and so they don't dare eat it. Um, that's, that's the wrong religion, and so they starve before they would kill a cow. Um, further, corrupt governments divert food from the people to satisfy their own ends of the leaders. There is no way that the world can be overpopulated to the point of endangering us. Christ will return before man can des destroy himself on the earth. There's no way that we can have the end of the world like John was talking about earlier. It's just not going to happen. Man cannot destroy himself. I don't care how powerful the bombs may be that man puts together. There is no way that man can destroy himself. Jesus is going to come before that happens. Now, notice the instructions he gives to them. First of all, we see how he tells them to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Then he says to subdue it and have dominion over it. Um, the idea of subduing and having dominion is the thought or the idea of studying the elements of the earth, the animals, the living things, the dead things, the rocks, and everything else, but to study the earth and to gain knowledge of God's creation. You know you call that real science? That which you can observe. And then we could say that the idea of subduing it includes the thought of uh, technology, as it were, in the implementation of that which has been studied for the greater good of man, as well as for the animals, learning how to be more productive with the animals. Um, this science and technology that he's talking about, the, in other words, the, when he says to subdue and have dominion, all of this is included in every activity that man is involved with even today. Um, but again, man has failed in his stewardship using the earth for self. God's intention was that man would be his stewards of the earth, but he has failed at that. And then God spoke of the provision that he has for man. There's going to be energy needed for his work, and that energy would be provided from the fruits and the herbs. And he was created in such a way that he could absorb the nutrients from the fruits and the herbs to enable him to function so that he could labor for the Lord. We, see in this, we will see in the second chapter the work that God had for him. But in any event, he clearly says to, to uh, subdue it and have dominion over it, and that is work in itself. But there is physical labor that we will see in the second chapter. Now, the supply that God had for him could not be exhausted. The nutrients that were available to man from Eden's perfect environment, 
did not require any fertilizer. <laughs> um, there were no depletion of nutrients from the ground as it is today. I understand that if you were to compare the amount of nutrients in a bowl of broccoli that was grown in 1942, that it would require 10 bowls today to equal that amount of nutrition. Well, Adam didn't have that problem. Can you imagine the flavors <laughs> that each of the fruit and vegetables would produce? Even broccoli would taste good. <laughs> um, the point, tomatoes would not taste like cardboard. <laughs> I mean, it must have been amazing flavors that came out of everything that he ate. And God had the same provision for the animals, again, from the plants. Brings up the question about today's carnivores. Uh, the lions and the tigers and the bears, oh my, they, they eat meat today and they are a threat to man. But then carnivores ate the herbs and grasses. Um Mosquitoes would suck on fallen pears. They'd leave man alone. Gnats wouldn't bother him either. The horse flies would stay away. They'd have other things to get. Now, did the animals like the lions, did they have fangs and claws fully developed at that point? Some have suggested that they were in recession, and then after the fall or after the flood, then that's when they, began, they developed more fully. Uh, that, that's possible, I suppose. God could do it either way. He could just say, you know, after the flood, you're going to eat meat, so you're going to need fangs and claws, so here they are. But the point is, um, there were no desires for any meat until after the fall or after the flood, possibly after the flood. During the millennium, it's going to be like this again. Um, Mosquitoes are not going to bother us in the millennium. Uh, we'll be in a tropical rainforest throughout the whole earth. There'll be no polar ice caps. So again, there'll be uh, plenty of room for mankind. The sea will be gone. So the, the area of the earth that, that uh, is covered by the sea will be available for man to live. Um, so consequently... As God looked at everything, he surveyed it, he saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now, every day up to this point, he said it was good. Not until God had made woman did he say it was very good. In other words, that was the last part of his creation. Um, and we recognize that at this time, God surveyed everything that he had made. And it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Then, as God evaluated, he just gives a summary of the whole of creation in chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And back in verse 31 of the previous chapter, he said it is very good exceedingly good everything was in perfect harmony every ecological system was absolutely flawless animals were not eating animals at this point um, even Satan and all of the angels were good at this point because they were a part of God's creation God created them as part of the hosts of heaven uh, there was nothing bad at all in all of creation, no diseases, no weaknesses, no bum shoulders, no bum knees, no f failing eyes. Everything was very good. Now, in verse 1, when he said the host of them all, the heaven and the earth were finished and all the host of them, that could refer to the stars as well as the angels and Satan himself. And in verse 2, in the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested. Now, notice he rested, past tense. He is not continually resting. He didn't wind up the earth and then turn it loose as an alarm clock and say, you're on your own. He, is, he rested the seventh day, 
But on the, the, the first day of the following week, he was working again to get ready for redemption. He knew the man was sin. Even before he did it, he knew what was going to happen. And so he would have begun the work of redemption even uh, the day after creation was finished. Now, the point is that God is still very active with his creation, with mankind. Uh, he began the good work in us, and he tells us he's going to finish it. He's not done. He's not finished with us. Now, when he rested, it was not because he was weary. God doesn't get weary. But he rested for the purpose of teaching man that he needs a day of rest. He was ref refreshed as he refocused on the redemption. But notice what he says in verse 3. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, set it apart for the benefit of man because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now the seventh day is the Sabbath. And it was the Sabbath was given for man's benefit to renew his strength for more labor in the coming week. That is a part of our culture that is, uh, is lacking. Um, because we tend to work every, every day. If we're not working on the job, then we're working around the house. Um, but we see, uh, studies have found that when animals are rested one day a week, that they function better. They are stronger uh, for the balance of the week. Even fasting has a correlation to that, that if they would withhold food from the animals, they would get hungry, but they would function better um, one day, if they would do that one day a week. Um, and then he ends the segment in verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. Now, the, before I leave the Sabbath, I need to highlight the fact that when God chose Israel, um, he made the Sabbath day a sign between him and Israel. Um, so that's one reason we do not stop on Saturday to worship. Um, we observe the times of worship or, or corporate worship uh, for the first day of the week in honor of the resurrection. Uh, and we see how the early church did that in the book of Acts. Now, the signature in verse 4, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth. This signature is, it occurs ten times in the book of Genesis each one apparently by a different writer, uh, concluding a segment of their writings. Adam apparently was the one who had written this up to this point. Um, and this signature, uh, these are the generations of, uh, has the idea that this, was the, uh, this concluded the writing of this segment. His creation was now finished. Now he would begin his work of redemption for man. You know, it's amazing to me that God knew that man, mankind would rebel, but yet he made man anyway because he had, he had in his mind from before the foundations of the world the redemption that he was planning to provide. And it wasn't until Jesus, the Son of God, was on the cross and as he cried out, it is finished, then the work of redemption was completed. Now, God began this work of redemption after he finished the week of creation. He spoke to Eve about the, her seed that would bruise the devil's head, um, pointing ahead to what he was going to do. Then he chose a group of people because of Abraham's faithfulness, because of his love for them. He chose Israel to reveal himself, and he worked in Israel teaching them to worship him and to follow him and to, to yield to him. They did not, but he continued to work, even bringing judgment. And then when they would repent, he would bless them. And then they would rebel again, and he would judge them. And on it went until finally they were carted off to Babylon and Assyria. Now, 
God continued to work preparing so the perfect time came in which he sent his son to provide that redemption. But then as he hung on the cross and he said, it is finished, that is when redemption was accomplished. Now there is one final act of redemption, that is the completion of redemption in the rapture. When he comes to, to take his bride home, um, the, this last work of redemption, and again, he does it. We do, we do nothing about it. Uh, when he comes for his bride, he comes for us, then we will see the completion. We will be perfected, able to see him as he is, able to walk with him in heaven. Now, redemption will continue in the tribulation period of the millennium in that people will be saved. But for the church, the completion of that redemption will be at the rapture. Now, as we look at the summary of God's work in the first few ch verses of chapter 2, we recognize that the rest of the chapter will give details of God's creation of man and woman. Um, but this is the... Um, this is the instructions that he gives us as he tells us about what he has made. Any questions or comments that you would add to this study? Or to this morning's message or perusing through Proverbs, I want to give you opportunity for exhortation. Mary? Yeah. Good. Good observation. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Very good point. All right. Anyone else? Your opportunity to uh, to praise him, to uh, exhort one another as we ponder the truths that we covered today. This morning as we see how God grows us through the stresses of life and then even the perusing through Proverbs, Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise. Any further comments or questions? Aaron? The beliefs are not wrong in and of themselves. It's the way a person uh, pursues that belief. If they have a spirit of, of pride that they know better than everyone else and that type of thing, that's when the problems come with the variations of that belief. There, I think there are instructions uh, that indicate a pre-trib rapture, but the other side says they see it for that. So... Um, but that's, that's further in the New Testament. It's not dealt with in the Old Testament at all, either one. All right, let's have a word of prayer.